Hello, Professor Berger. Welcome to Iran. How was the trip? It was a long, long trip, but um, it was worth the effort, I would say. <laughs> uh, so let us uh, go directly to, to our questions. Uh, why, what interested you uh, in, in getting into a journalism program? Well, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in, in literature. And uh, I could see that um, there were very few opportunities for jobs after I graduated. And I liked to write, so I thought, well, I'll become a journalist. And so uh, originally I went to the University of California at Berkeley in the summer. But then I got a grant at the University of Iowa. Uh, and when I was anxious and go, to go there because I have a writer's workshop, a very famous writer's workshop, where many of our novelists have studied. So I went uh, to Iowa and I got a master's degree and, uh, in journalism, but I also uh, studied at the writer's workshop with a, a mad novelist. <laughs> and, um, that, and I was, I was offered a job after I graduated at, at a, a magazine called Better Homes and Gardens, a very well-known magazine, but I was drafted into the Army 11 days after I got my master's degree. So I spent two years in the Army as a, as a writer, public information office. I used to write speeches for generals yeah. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. Then um, I also worked at the Washington Post uh, weekend evenings as a high school sports writer. So the money that I made uh, with that, I, I then went to Europe and spent a year traveling around Europe. I came back, worked a little bit, and then I went to graduate school, got a PhD in American Studies, because I came to the conclusion that I liked academic life. Yeah. Uh, you know, you are a great professor, one of the greatest professors in communication and media studies in the world. Could you uh, imagine that, uh, you know, during the BA or MA, uh, degree in studies in the, you know, 19, I think, 50s. Well, yes. Uh, th thank you for the compliment. Not everyone would agree <laughs> with you. But uh, you can never anticipate what's going to happen when you're, when you're 35 years old. Yeah. You don't know what, what it's going to be like when you're 50 years old. So things happen. Ge you know, changes happen. Accidents happen, so forth and so on. So um, all I knew was that uh, originally, you see, I was in a different department. I was in a social science department, an interdisciplinary social science department. And my colleagues in that department were, very, were not very friendly, to put it mildly. So then I found a way to transfer to the, to the broadcasting department, which is really a radio and television department. And now it has become electronic communication arts department as well. So that was a big change in my life. I, I was 12 years in the other department, and then 25 years in the broadcasting department. It, um, and it was very well, it was suited for me because I was writing on television, I was writing on comics, I was writing on advertising, all kinds of things that are of interest to, to people in the media studies. You know. Yeah. So, what interested you in getting, uh, you know, a PhD in American studies? Well, uh, I like the concept of a kind of interdisciplinary approach toward a subject. You see, basically, if you look at what cultural studies d does, it has psychoanalytic theorists, it has semioticians, it has Marxists, sociologists, so on. and they combine different uh, disciplines uh, depending on the topic they're dealing with. Well, it was the same thing in American studies. Uh, you, would take, you could take courses in history, political science, philosophy, so that you have a kind of background in American culture and then use that for whatever topic you're interested in. So if you're interested in te becoming a literature professor, you would emphasize courses in literature, literary theory, things like that. If you're interested in becoming a media professor, you, you take courses in, in courses involving media and mass communication theory and things like that. I took no courses on communication theory. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had a, <laughs> well, actually that's not true. In, in my master's degree, I, I had courses on communication theory and things like that. But basically, I, I, uh, I had no notion of where I was going to end when I got my degree. And it turns out I was offered uh, jobs in three different kinds of departments. I was offered a job in an English department to become a professor of literature, you know, teach literary studies and things like that. I was offered a position in a humanities department to teach and teach uh, whatever humanities people do. And I was offered this job in the social science department in San Francisco, 
well, it turns out the job in San Francisco paid less than the other jobs and had less prestige, but it had a wonderful place to live. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm from Boston. I yes, I'm from Boston, yes. So I chose San Francisco State University because the quality of life in San Francisco is so high yeah. that uh, it can't be duplicated, even though the other schools may have more prestige. You know. yeah. Okay, so uh, in two or three of uh, your books I have read you, uh, you have uh, such a great respect for Rashomon. What was the role of uh, Rashomon in your academic life? Uh, Rashomon, yes. In 1951, I was a freshman at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I remember my roommate and I said, well, let's go to the movies, and there was this Japanese film playing. We had no idea what, was, what it was like. But that, er, that film uh, absolutely revolutionized my intellectual life because the wonderful thing about Rashomon is you realize from watching that film, and, and Kurosawa is a master filmmaker, that, that there's no one way to perceive reality. Uh, in, this, in this film, a, a, a man and a woman and a bandit are, are involved in various things. The bandit may have raped the man's wife. The man's wife may have voluntarily submitted to the bandit. You know. Uh, so the, there's all of this stuff. It's from a story called In a Grove. And then there's also a woodcutter who's been w going through the forest, and he happens, he's up in the hills, and he happens to see everything that goes on there. And then what happens is eventually they're all testifying before a judge or something. You don't see the judge, but they're all giving testimony. What's marvelous about the film is, uh, like, the husband, the father, the, uh, he's a samurai. The samurai is, is found dead. Yeah. So the question is, what happened? So uh, the wife of the samurai said, in a hypnotic trance, uh, because of the hatred in the eyes of, of her husband, she killed him with this knife that she had. But when the uh, samurai talks, now he's dead, but they have a woman who's uh, sort of a spiritual, uh, you know, uh, speaking sort of with his voice in the trance. No, he said he was so heartbroken by seeing what happened with his wife and the samurai that he killed himself. Yeah. And the bandit said, uh, no, uh, they had a tremendous fight. He was one of the greatest fighters who ever clashed to us with the, with the bandit, but he eventually killed him, you see. But the, wood, the woodcutter gives an altogether different story. He said the bandit and the, and the, uh, and the samurai, when they were fighting, they were, their knees were shaking, they were terrified, they were just, it was kind of a, a crazy thing. So what, basically what happens is you realize there's no one way to sort of understand reality. Everyone has a different perspective on things, and you can't, sometimes you can't necessarily know what happened in that grove, because all the stories were conflicting. Well, that, of course, is a kind of metaphor for what happens in academic life. Sociologists see something in this way. Psychoanalytic critics see the same thing in a different way. So it, it sort, of, sort of set me on a path of seeing that there are different ways of perceiving anything. Let's see. Yeah, so, so uh, is that the main reason that you decided to start to write uh, mystery books? No, no. <laughs> Uh, the, that was a, a rather curious situation. See, I'm an artist, right? Yeah. So one of my editors said, uh, why don't you do a comic strip on postmodernism? But the problem was I found it very difficult using the comic strip format. It requires a certain kind of uh, temperament and things. But what, what one day, while I was wrestling with this, I was writing in my journal and an image popped into my head. The image was of a professor slumped over a table. There's a knife in his back. There's a, a bullet hole in his head. There's a poison arrow in his cheek. And his drink, which is spilled over, has fumes showing that it was poisoned too. So he was killed four different ways in the first page of my murder mystery. So I, I, I went to my editor and I said, I have the idea. I think I'd like to turn it into a murder mystery. He said, well, go ahead and, and do it. So then I faced the problem of I had one page, <laughs> I had 300 words or 200 words. How am I going to get 50,000 words <laughs> out of this? 
So then I started, um, I developed, I have a, uh, I usually have an international cast of characters. I had a Russian, a Ru what happened is he was at a, he was, he was having a dinner party at his house. Yeah. He's a famous professor of postmodernism from the University of California at Berkeley. The lights go out and when the lights come on, he's dead, you see. So uh, the police, my detective comes to investigate. And so uh, at that party was a French semiotician, sociological, a sociologist, a Russian linguistics professor, a Japanese, uh, uh, I don't know, semiotician. I mean, the basic things, I had a semiotician, I had a sociologist, I had a political scientist. I had different scholars, each of whom has a different perspective on postmodernism. So he interviewed, and, and the wife uh, of the wife of the, uh, of the murdered professor's name is Nucky. It taught him Nucky. Now, you have to realize that Nucky is the Italian word for potato dumpling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So they interview, uh, they, they interview, he interviews each one of the people at the table, and they all give him their particular perspective on postmodernism. See. Yeah. Then uh, the the professor goes into the he, he does this in the in the library of the of the dead professor. Yeah. Uh, then he goes into the library of the dead professor and he finds that he has written letters on his computer to many important postmodernists Jürgen Habermas, uh, you know, all kinds of about five, four or five different people. To each one of them, he said, "You're the star of the conference that's yeah. <laughs> that's coming." But he then he then says, "I hope in your discussion you'll talk about this, that, and the other thing." So, basically, I'm sort of putting content into the letter, you know, um, a Baudrillard, and he's talking about, you know. So he has all these very important postmodernists. Then I have another section in which one has a dream, one writes in a journal, and so forth. So eventually we come to the conclusion in which uh, the detective has to figure out what is actually going on. Now it turns out from the dialogue of the wife that he's able to realize that the, the professor was dead before anyone killed him. Yeah. <laughs> so he, none of them are being, going to be sent to jail. They all try to kill him, but you can't be sent to jail for killing a dead man. Yeah. <laughs> And the, and the last chapter is the first chapter of the book. It's also postmodern in the sense that it has different genres in it. It has a, a recipe for, for cheesecake. It has a video, a kind of imaginary video. So it's, it was a lot of fun. And it's used in different courses uh, in, in universities because it's really a textbook in the form of a murder mystery. The problem is when you do that, uh, it becomes so didactic that you, you sort of lose the dramatic function, but it's a comical thing. I mean, you, you can realize the, the names are all kind of zany and the things that happen are all kind of bizarre. Yeah. 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 Uh, you have worked with uh, Umberto Eco. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you believe in postmodernism. In some, somehow, I, I, I suppose that there are many versions of postmodernism. Umberto Eco, uh, you know that you know, believes in, in, in uh, limits of interpretation. Uh, so how far you, can we, uh, you, you think we can go when interpreting some uh, phenomena like, for example, what you saw in Rochamon or what you wrote about, you know, the murder professor yeah. or other, your, in your other books, for example, The Elephant and, uh, you know, Blind Man. Yes. Uh, how far we can go? So, can we interpret, you know, to draw interpretations from, you know, yes. uh, you know, I don't know, from one book on, on uh, mystery? Uh, can we draw interpretations on my behavior, for example, in another city? Yeah, you know, um, see, my, my approach toward things is to learn certain methodologies. See, once I have the methodologies, I can see whether I can apply any of them to whatever it is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm analyzing. So, uh, uh, you know, remember this is like quali this is qualitative analysis. This isn't uh, data, you know, data rich analysis. This is interpretations of what things mean based on concepts and so forth and so on. And many people think these interpretations are ridiculous. But what I do is I, I say if I've made an argument that seems to lo be logical and covers as much 
much of whatever I'm, I'm dealing with as I can, then uh, consider whether you think that it's worth, uh, worth accepting. And if you don't want to accept it, you don't have to accept it. You know, do the best you can. But you know, when, I, when I make an analysis, I try to cover as much of the, of the text or whatever it is I'm dealing with as possible. Now, sometimes this involves a certain amount of whimsy, I will say. like. Uh, in my book, Bloom's Morning, I analyze things like uh, electronic toothbrushes and uh, things like that. Uh, toast. <laughs> yeah. uh, the significance of toasters in people's lives, you see. Now, that might seem to be relatively trivial, but there's a whole field of uh, archaeology and anthropology called material culture. And what they do is they analyze objects, simple objects showing human workmanship. That's the general definition of material culture and see what they reveal about the culture. Mm -hmm. So in essence, I, well, I didn't realize I, I was doing a, a material culture analysis because I also have other, other, other activities like jogging and stuff like that. But most of the book is about material culture. It's a very conventional uh, approach toward things, although most people would not deal with uh, trash compactors and uh, microwave ovens, you see. Uh, but you see, that's part of everyone's life. So if you, my theory is if you want to know about American culture, know what people do, that they, they use toasters, that they have trash compactors, that they, use, that they have electronic knives or electronic toothbrushes, and all these things that seem to be rather trivial. But the interesting thing is that the critics have said it's a, it's a very powerful portrait of American culture and, and an attack on sort of the consumerism in, in American culture. So I can see that, you know, uh, you see the life, everyday life in America and elsewhere as, uh, you know, something interconnected all aspects of life. So is that an explanation that you wrote uh, you know, on, on such a broad uh, uh, topics? I can see that you have, you've written 70 books, over 70 books yeah, and, count, and counting. Yeah. Thank, thank God it is counting. Uh, so is that the reason that you think a professor of communication should, should have perspective on, on many different uh, aspects yes. of life? You have to enhance the definition of communication, you see. Uh, if you think communication is just me talking with you, then you're going to have a very limited perspective on things. But if you think communication involves the messages that uh, your toaster is giving about you, <laughs> then it's a, different, it's, a, it's a different story. But you see, um, I've also applied this methodology to other cultures. So, for example, uh, I've written books on Japanese culture. I've written books on Thailand, Thai culture. They're all tourism books. That is, the beginning has data for, for courses on tourism for students who might be interested in. But then, basically what it is, it's using, uh, using semiotics and psychoanalytic theory and things like that to analyze important artifacts and objects and practices and so forth. So, for example, in my book in Japan, Japan was rich with iconic uh, topics to, to, to deal with. Sumo wrestlers, geishas. Um, there are these, um, there are, there's a lot of sexual hang-ups in Japan. So men would purchase um, underwear worn by schoolgirls. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. But, um, so, and then they play pachinko, which is a kind of vertical, um, vertical, uh, it's a kind with little metal balls that go clashing around and so forth. Uh, so I, I, uh, I was looking in Japan for sort of iconic aspects of the culture that I could deal with and analyze. And, and so my analysis also is based on readings of other people, too. I always bring in a lot of material from other scholars and so forth to sort of enhance my discussion. And, uh, so I've done, that for, uh, I've done that for Thailand. I've done it for uh, India. If the culture has a kind of richness of iconic material that I can grab hold of, I can do it. So, the books all start with, with tourism data and material book tourism, things like that. But they end up as being like a cultural anthropologist's analysis <coughs> of the culture. Yeah. And uh, you have uh, two very important, oh, sorry. Uh, two very important uh, books on, on methodology. Mm, one is, the, is, is media and communication research methods. The other is uh, media analysis techniques. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have been, and they have been cited more than uh, 1,000 times by, yeah, by other, yeah, yeah. It's on Google Scholar. Uh, so what, uh, what made you think it is important yeah. 
yes. for you to write those books because you know uh, these books are, are very uplight you know try to be as, as specific as possible what made you yeah. convinced to, to write this book it's a good question let's take media analysis techniques first what happened was many years ago, this professor was putting together a collection of articles and he asked me to write an article on semiotics for his book, a chapter on semiotics. Um, he was supposed to pay me $150 for my efforts, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it's like to deal with professors. You know, yeah, they don't yeah, always. Yeah. So I had this book, uh, I had this chapter on, on semiotics. I said, well, what, what would happen if I would do similar chapters on psychoanalytic theory, Marxist theory, and sociological theory, the, the four main pillars of cultural analysis? And so what I did is I sat down and I wrote um, chapters on those, cha on those topics, psychoanalytic theory, which is all, I used to teach a seminar on psychoanalytic theory in the media, on sociological uh, theory in the media, and, and um, psycho psych so I had semiotic, psychoanalytic, sociological, and Marxist. Then I had, I had written a book uh, about uh, blue jeans. <laughs> but I couldn't find anyone who was interested, so I was going to put material in blue jeans in the back of the book to, to show how you can use it. But they said, well, that's not media. <clears throat> So I put those, four, those chapters on blue jeans in another book. But in any case, <laughs> uh, never waste anything. That's my theory. You never yeah. waste anything. So uh, then I decided, well, what, what, what topics can I choose? Because popular culture changes so quickly. You write on one subject before you know it, it's dead. Nobody is interested in it. So I chose American football. That's always with us. Foot, football is always with us. Yeah. So I kept keep each chapter. I, each time I do a book, I modify it a little bit and so forth. I add something. You know. So I did football. Then I took a, an important film, Murder in the Orient Express. It's a kind of classic film. I used that one. I did something on news because news is always you know, you know yeah. important part of media. Uh, so I did a film. I did news. I did uh, sports. I forget. I forget what other ones I did, but I, I came up with like four or five uh, chapters in the first edition of that book, which is very thin. It was a very thin book with big type and it cost $7.95. You know. first, uh, uh, first edition. First edition. first edition of that book. And then uh, what happened is uh, over the, they, my publishers were neglected. It. But then over the years, they said, well, do another edition. And that, uh, that edition started doing pretty well. So, th th so then they said, well, do another edition. And now I just came up with the fifth edition uh, last year. Uh, but you see, this book, I've been doing new editions with this book for 30 years. I've been working on this book off and on for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, if you have a book like that, you, you, you do a new edition every three years. So if I were like a traditional scholar, I would have 10 editions of media analysis techniques, and I would be brain dead. <laughs> but in any, what, so what happened is uh, it's doing tolerably well. Because you know, publishers are in the business of make money. Yeah. So they're making a little bit of money from it, so they keep on asking me to do new editions. So I just did this new one, and now I've, I've just done an, the, fifth, the fourth edition of media and communication research methods. So let me tell you how I happened to write that book. Yeah. I'm a Bostonian, so my, my family is in Boston, so I had an opportunity to go to a conference in Boston. What was the, the date? I'm sorry. What? what? What was the date of this conference in Boston? Oh, long time ago. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago. Oh, 20, 20, 30 years, long time ago. 30 years ago, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I went to this conference, and it turns out that the editor, the communication editor of Sage, which is located in Los Angeles, but the communication editors live wherever they want. And this communication editor lives in Boston, lived in Boston. So I went to the conference and then she, I got together with this woman who was the, the, the communication editor. She said, well, we have a problem with one of your other books. So, could you? so I went into the office and it took 10 minutes, I changed everything. She said, you're a real pro author. <laughs> then uh, she took me out for lunch to have a nice lobster dinner. You know, with, well, office is very popular in, uh, in America. Yeah. So I'm sitting down at the table. She reaches into, her, uh, reaches into her bag, pulls out a book on media research methods. She said, we published this book and it's not doing very well. You know, how about writing a book on media and research methods? 
I said, but I've never taught a course in that subject. I don't. <laughs> so she said, write 60,000 words in six months, in a year. You know, that's what she said. Give me 60,000 words in, in six months or whatever it is. So I looked at the book on the flight back to Boston. Then I looked at all the books I had on research methods. I contacted my colleagues at the university who taught courses and they asked for, this, for them to send me their, syllab their syllabi so I could see what books they used and what topics they dealt with. On the basis of that, I came up with a, a list of topics that were important for qualitative and for quantitative. So, the problem with quantitative was the chapter on statistics. Yeah. Now it turns out my son has a PhD in mathematics, but he, he's not the kind of person who would do something like that. He's just, it's not his, it's busy with his. Not his thing, we would yeah. say. But I had a semiotician friend in Bulgaria. <laughs> in Bulgaria. So I was complaining to him. I've got to write, you know, I took a course in statistics years ago. I don't remember very much. I said, I, I've got to have a chapter in statistics and I don't really know very much. He said, well, but he said, my wife is a great statistician. So she'll write the chapter for you. So once his wife wrote the chapter for me and she wrote, a, I thought, a very good chapter, very easy to understand and so forth. Then I added stuff at the back. You know. So then uh, we put it all together and uh, we, we, we threw it out in the world to see what would happen. And um, it did tolerably well. But they didn't seem to be terribly interested in doing a new edition. <laughs> Somehow or another, eight or nine years later, they contacted me and said, why don't you do a new edition of, for the book? And so that was the second edition. And then, a few, then four or five years later, they asked me the third edition. And then that came out two years ago. Then they want a new edition that's going to come out two years after the old edition. That's very unusual because it's usually three years. So I, I made the new edition and I sent it off two days before I came to Iran. Oh. Yes, so I'm waiting, to, I'm waiting to get the copy edited uh, version, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Berger, there is a debate on dumping down in American universities. On what? Dumping down in American oh, universities. Down. Yeah. Uh, how pervasive do, do you think it is? All pervasive. <laughs> all pervasive. Uh, even probably, you know, in a, in a very good school like Berkeley, a large percentage of the freshmen who come to Berkeley don't know how to write adequately, you know, or compute adequately, you know. Now that is a very selective school. You have to understand thousands of people apply to, to go to Berkeley, you see. Now if you eliminate the top 50 schools in, in America, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and a bunch of others, they're very selective, and they generally get students who are able to, talk, to, do, to write pretty well. But even in the good schools, they often can't write very well. But after that, uh, the quality of the students, because you have to think of it this way, 40 years ago, 12% or 15% of people went to the university, now 55%. So the question is, are those 55% intellectually uh, able to even do the, do, the, do the work. So to handle, to handle that, what happens is that the professors often dumb down the stuff. If you have dummies, you have to teach, <laughs> you have to dumb down uh, the stuff. Now this, doesn't, uh, this isn't everywhere in all courses and so forth, but it's pervasive. Like at San Francisco State, 30% um, of the students who were accepted at that school couldn't do a adequate mathematics or writing. So they, uh, they now what they're having to, them do is go to the community colleges where it's much cheaper to train them. Because it costs, the professors are, teach less in, 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 in the state university system than in the community college system. So it's much less expensive to train someone to, to teach them how to, do, how to write or teach them uh, mathematics. You know. I looked at the catalog in my university once and a third of the courses were sort of remedial math. I mean, it's pathetic. You know? yeah. So you're in a university and you're teaching students uh, algebra or whatever, you know? I don't know what, what it is. So it's a real, it's a real problem. You know? Perhaps the reasons are uh, economic. So, uh, you know, students do not like, you know, 
uh, tough academic disciplines. So universities uh, have to, you know, lower their standards so they, they could, you know, attract more students and get, and, and, and solve some pro kind of. Well, in certain areas, I mean, I don't think they're they're lowering them in chemistry and physics and you know, things like that, but in the humanities and in uh, social science and so forth, a certain degree of that uh, takes place. I'm not saying it's universal in every every professor and every department. There's some people who have standards and the cost them a lot of problem. I was one of them. See. Yeah. The students, when they took my course, I told them, I'm going to give you what you deserve. They didn't like that. Because they have a sense of entitlement. Many students nowadays in America, from the age of two, they're all told how wonderful they are. You know? yeah. it's, it's, it's true. There's a real problem. Kids are brought up with a sense that they're absolutely fabulous human beings and wonderful, and everything they do is wonderful and so forth. And so you come into a class, and the, and the student and the professor says, well, actually, you're a C-grade student. <laughs> it's traumatic for them. You know? I remember I had a student once. Uh, uh, she happened to be a black woman. And she came in the first day of class. She was talking to a friend. She said, I have a B plus average in this school, you know, and, 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 and loud enough so I could hear. She was a C student, you know. She said to me, do you know my husband's a lawyer? Because what she was suggesting is if I didn't give her, you know, the great grade, he'd sue me. Yes, and sue me. Unfortunately for her, though, I had statistics about her grades and all the you know, in every exam and so forth, and it computed to to C C plus or C whatever it was. So it's a real problem uh, because universities uh, nowadays are sort of um, like businesses. The business model has taken over. Presidents of universities are interested in making money and uh, things like that. And so education is just sort of one byproduct uh, of, of the thing. Not that it's completely universal or that every school is full of dummies and so forth and so on. And some small schools are extremely good. But, but generally speaking, the quality of the students. But that's also to be explained in terms of the, of the, the number of students who are applying. So it's like anything else. If you have a huge percentage of the population applying, that doesn't mean they all have the intellectual ability to, to do the work. Yeah. And uh, as a last question, uh, you have a wonderful book uh, titled Ads, Fats, and uh, Consumer Culture. Yes. Uh, and you have been to Iran for, for six days, I think. So how do you think this book and the idea of this book could be applied to the Iranian society and culture? Yes, uh, actually that's the old edition. I have a newer edition of the book. Uh, Let's see, isn't it somewhere here below? Yes, here. Here's the newest, the fifth edition. Yeah, yeah. How could it be applied to Iranian culture? It could be right to any culture, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Although a good deal of the book deals with uh, advertising in American culture, but it also deals with you know, uh, the amount of advertising in the world and how, how much is money is spent in America relative to the rest of the world. So on. But what's crucial about that book is I have two chapters in that book. About one is how to analyze advertisements, and the other is how to analyze television commercials. So regardless of what culture you're in, if you're an Iranian student and you, you read that book and you learn how to analyze uh, a, a, a print advertisement, and, and I have a list of topics to discuss and so forth and so on, uh, people who have commented on that book said that uh, it's, it's really a teaching manual. Yeah. So uh, even though I may be talking about, the, like for my television commercial, it's 1984, this very famous television commercial for the Macintosh and that, that appeared in 1984. You can use the methodology for any, for the, for the commercials in, in Iran or France or, or anywhere or anywhere else. So that is, uh, that, uh, all of my books generally have some, some combination of theory and method and application. Okay. Uh, there isn't a book I've written, if, if, if you, if, you know, if I, if I think about it, that doesn't usually have something along that line. Very few don't, you know. Uh, even I wrote a book on semiotics, <coughs> and what that has is it has a concept and then it has the application. So I don't have a, like a section of applications in the back, I have applications for each concept. So that's the way I work, you know, that's my, my method is, if a student learns a methodology and doesn't, have, doesn't know how to use it, what good does it do them? Yeah. Yeah. Professor Bergen, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah.